2020 began with excitement and promise of growth for our side community at the Envision Forum in January. You're all deliberately working to dominate your markets. When you're no longer operating and worrying about all the little weeds of your business, you can focus on growing. Look at how many of you are in the top three, top five in your respective markets. We really are so lucky to be partnering with the very, very best in the profession and pushing this profession to be even better. With brands that the market recognizes as the leaders in service and in results. This is transformational for a real estate agent. Side is able to launch my two and a half billion dollar career in less than like a month and a half. They gave me all the personnel and all the technology. We're gonna put all of our technology behind you. So you will now be able to be the leader in your market. And save that agent tens of hours of time every week because that's what's really gonna make a big difference for them. And then invariably the client on the other end. Every delicious moment I've had in real estate comes from being brave and putting myself out there and claiming a brand. It's that brand recognition, just like if you see the arches of the McDonald's. That is the branding, it's the impressions. It's been life-changing and it's only just gotten started. The power of side nationwide is massive and it's only getting bigger. There is so much power behind that network. In this Houston market, we're able to really be at the forefront and be ahead of that curve. That's one of the cool things about Side is they're like your eyes and ears in the industry too. There's nothing that they're not on top of. Continuing to have evolution is where Side is just like, boom, that's what it's about. Things happen in the blink of an eye. The industry changes that fast. I'm just glad to be a part of Side with all the technology and the resources that they provide. And I know I'm excited to see where we're gonna be a year from now. Breaking right now, sources telling Channel 2 the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo will be shut down for the rest of the season due to concerns over coronavirus. The reality for some 7 million people in the city by the bay, they are expected to stay home, all in hopes, of course, of stopping the spread of COVID-19. There are 18 states now that have statewide shelter-in-place ordinances in effect. Immediately, a shockwave went through the community. There was a lot of broken hearts. There were a lot of people saying, I don't know if I'm going to feed my family now. This is a challenging period for us as an industry. Things will develop every single day. We'll keep you up to date. The most important thing is to make sure your clients have what they need. And on the other, to be really safe about anything that you're doing. Real estate for now is not listed as an essential business. And so we should not be doing showings. We won't be able to do anything in person for a period of time. But what we can do is maintain the relationships we already have. This is a watershed moment. What is society going to look like after we get out of this? With a lot of uncertainty, trepidation, and questions from clients, we push forward, arming our partners with the latest information and COVID updates. The federal government has included real estate in as essential service. What it does allow and does clarify is that realtors can go out and show property to their clients. The biggest concern obviously buyers are having is the economy and their ability to qualify to purchase a home if they might lose their job. But I think crisis or crash, real estate is still the safest place to be. I actually think that we will see home prices remain relatively consistent. Even through a pandemic, Top agents leverage partnering with Sai to grow their businesses and create their own brands. I would not want to be at the mercy of someone else's company right now. I'm so glad I took action when I did take action. In the midst of a global pandemic, I decided to partner with Sai. I can't get the furniture in, I can't get desks, but I chose not to delay this. Side as a company is well positioned to really help firms like my own weather the storm and be better positioned to service clients through the use of technology. All of our agents were checking in with the business owners and letting them know we'd be there for them. Our partners were organizing efforts to raise money for firefighters or doing so to get meals to people who are being laid off or, or masks for those who didn't have access. Katie and I took on the, the flamingoing, the idea, especially geared toward kids who were sad that they weren't getting to see their friends. You shift the way you do business. And I feel like if you do that with an empathetic heart, you're still gonna be successful in this business. The lone wolf is vulnerable, but the pack survives. So 
Let's stick together as partners and help each other get through this. Time is now to really double down on your marketing and your actions. You know, for as much as the pandemic has put awful, awful things into play, um, it has, I think, brought families together and understanding and compassion has grown. Our partners were able to transition seamlessly into that new normal, so they did not lose a single beat. Thank you so much for having me at the Side Evolution Forum. To succeed, we must all evolve. You have to grow and you have to be able to delegate and leverage. It was just really important to stay active and aware uh, and visible in the community. We were able to pull a 180 on how our perception of the market is going to be during COVID with the support from all the side groups. Together, we are stronger. That's a theme of the convention. We are a part of the side network of partners. Anybody that asks me in the community that wants a donation, I know that I can and I will. Truly grateful to be a part of this session, truly grateful to SIDE. It's been a tremendous year despite everything. We have a very, very special person to ARIA, and that is our President 2021, Amy Kong. ARIA shows me how to leverage our resources and relationship to help the community in need. We are very much aligned with you, Amy. Just really, really excited to work with Amy. And most recently, she partnered with us here at SIDE to launch Trust Real Estate. With a much renewed sense of optimism, side partners came together once again to collaborate and evolve new strategies in the new normal. What I want to learn more about is your experience of having any type of fear. How do I own my neighborhood? How would you guys define the luxury real estate market? So this custom plan that you do, you do this for all the agents, right? I've got six top producers, and we're gonna debate on which lead channel is the best lead channel for your real estate business. As this unforgettable year came to a close, we learned how to adapt to a new way of doing business and engaging with our clients. We welcomed amazing new partners, and we are now able to look forward to a safer and even more successful 2021. A successful 2021 would be just having more balance, and I think I have the tools and I have the systems in place to do so. My goal is always just to exceed what I did the year before. I do plan on recruiting in 2021. I'm at five now, I wanna be at, at 10 agents by the time we're midway through the year. We knew what we needed to be doing. It was just the fact of having this catalyst like COVID really push it forward. When COVID started, we really got to sit back, listen, observe to what the industry was saying and take our own approach to it. And I think that that's where we saw substantial growth. You have to always be pushing the limits, you know, and learning new things. We have to innovate. Real estate's never gonna be the same, even after we get a vaccine. You know, technology pre-COVID was kind of the thing that was tearing all of us apart. And then in this really interesting way, it was this one thing that brought us all closer. I think that side agents are going to emerge from this crisis in a better position than virtually any other agents in the country. Good morning and welcome to Side by Side. I'm Hillary Saunders, one of the co-founders and chief broker officer here at Side. Along with my other two co-founders, CEO Guy Gal, and chief technology officer Ed Wu, we are thrilled that you are joining us for two very full days of inspiration, education, and one-of-a-kind networking across the Side community. As I reflected on 2020, this holiday season, I was overcome by a range of varying emotions. This year started out with seeing many of you at the Side Thank You Forum in San Francisco and hearing your stories of success and excitement of what was to come. The energy in those rooms was palpable as we cheered each other on and we were able to share some now much missed hugs. A few short weeks later, as I came home with my twins from the hospital, we entered the month of March with no idea of what was to come. 
March did not behave according to traditional farmer folklore, which is coming in like a lion and out like a lamb. Rather, COVID came in like a lion and turned into Godzilla, smashing through any type of normal that we had become accustomed to. Our team quickly sprung into action to facilitate an immediate support system for our partners by holding weekly town halls, providing the latest COVID rules and restrictions, and proactively suggesting how partners could alter their marketing and lead gen programs to work more efficiently and intelligently in this challenging environment. At the end of the summer, we held our first virtual side forum, aptly entitled Evolution, and over 750 of you attended, making it a huge success. Many of you experienced your own personal evolutions last year and gained a skill set that will enable you and those around you to not only survive, but thrive for many years to come. I am proud and honored to be a part of this side community. You each took uncertainty and fear in stride. You refuse to be paralyzed and stay in place in spite of sheltering in place and put forth your best efforts into your businesses, families, and local communities, giving back in a time of tremendous need. Many of our partners reported having their best year ever, all while stealthily dodging Godzilla. So welcome 2021. May interest rates remain low, demand for housing high, and may your passion and dedication to your craft and clients propel you to levels that you have only ever dreamed of. And without further ado, may I introduce my partner in crime, one of the most generous people that I know, and also one of your biggest advocates, Guy Gal. Welcome to Side by Side. Hey, Long Hillary. time to no see. I know, it's been a minute. Nice to see I'll take this off. I get to see off. your face for once and Finally. For a few minutes. Yeah. And likewise. Well, thank you. Uh, without it being over, you know, Zoom and a right. little, little blurry and all that. Oh, yeah. But you look wonderful. What have you been up to? So do you. I mean, you had twins 11 months ago. I did. Yeah, I did. Congratulations. Thank you. If you could look back when you started 2020, what kind of goals did you set for yourself at the beginning of the year that you may or may not have accomplished or got you railed or... What happened towards the end of the year as you did your look back? Because I know you do a, kind of a year in review reflection yourself. I'm just so pleased to say that when all the dust settled on 2020, we actually achieved more than what we thought we would when we started the year before we even knew that COVID would be a thing and that we'd all spend seven months of the year uh, at, home. At, at home primarily, uh, of course, uh, our, our partners um, spent a lot more time outside the home. Gosh, uh, the community yeah. involvement was amazing from our partners. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later because that was so inspiring to me. It yeah. sort of got, got me going, right? Whenever things got uh, challenging and difficult, all I had to do was look at what our partners were doing and how they were persevering and how resilient they were and how they were going out of their way to be of service to their communities when they had every reason, every reason to do the complete opposite, just to do nothing. Absolutely. And that was, yeah, very inspiring, yeah. very motivating. It is. And it reflected, I think, uh, as you know, I'm sure you'll dive into, a lot of our partners had their best year ever in 2020. So yes. I'm, I'm thoroughly thrilled to be working in, in the um, same kind of page with these amazing people. It's, a, it's been a privilege, and it was a privilege in 2020, and I'm just really excited to see uh, how it all comes together in 21. But so far, it's looking better than it ever has before. So I think we'll continue to advance the mission this year. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They are, absolutely. And I know you're going to dive into it in a bit. And with that, Guy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Hillary. Hi everyone, it's been a long time since we've seen each other in person and I'm really, really hoping and optimistic that at the next forum uh, this summer, we'll be able to actually do this in person and come together once more. Uh, but until then, I'm glad that we can still have this experience and communicate with each other in this way. 2020 was an unprecedented year when the pandemic struck what was most profound for me and most meaningful is that the side community really stepped up. It was so inspiring to see so many partner teams 
elevate and support their communities during this time. Many, many, many of you got hyper involved serving whatever need the community had, whether it was organizing efforts to raise money for firefighters during the wildfires or getting meals to people who were laid off through shelter in place, providing masks for those that didn't have immediate access or bringing smiles to kids' faces by planting flocks of flamingos in their front yards on their birthdays overnight. These were acts of service and courage that even though you did altruistically have translated into more business for you because it made your brands top of mind. And of course, as we know, buyers and sellers really want to work with people who are pillars in their communities. So thank you so much for your care. Thank you so much for making such a huge difference in the lives of so many. 2020 really taught us to never stop moving and growing no matter the circumstance. When shelter in place first happened, so many agents, as is normal for human beings, decided to sort of freeze and stop in place alongside of sheltering and not do anything. There was every excuse and every reason to do just that. But as is often the case, the worst thing you can do when you have a lot of momentum is to interrupt it because it's going to take so much time to spin back up and get that momentum back again. No matter what life throws at you, find a way to keep making forward progress. Virtually all of the agents that Side is partnered with kept going and found a way to meet those challenges and obstacles with creativity and resourcefulness. And it's that resilience, that awesome resilience that allowed you to have career defining years during shelter in place. Full-time, dedicated, top producing agents and teams only represent about 4% of the overall agent population and historically produce roughly 30 to 50% of the real estate transactions in any given market. You are the ones that persevered through shelter in place because you have that sophistication, that experience. Maybe not specifically with the pandemic, but you know how to work through challenges. When we first began the journey of side four years ago, we knew that those agents, that the 4% uh, of top producing individuals and teams that contribute 30 to 50% of the overall transaction volume in any given market, that over time you would consolidate more and more of the transactions and represent a much larger share of the overall pie. And so COVID really accelerated the consolidation that was already happening because 96% of agents sheltered in place, whereas top producing agents and teams continued going and therefore expanding and growing and became busier than they were ever before. And now, when we run all the numbers for 2020 in the next few months and all that dust settles, we suspect, in fact, we're very confident that you all will now represent a much larger share of the transactions in your market and it's coming at the expense of those agents who maybe do one, two, three deals a year. And that actually is a good thing. It's a good thing for the average person who's buying or selling a home because their interest is best served by folks like yourselves, by full-time dedicated professionals who are really experienced and know what they're doing and can deliver the best results, the best experience, and ultimately the best service. And so it's fair to say that as things continue to progress, less agents will represent more of the overall transactions. And that's why I'm of the mind that 2021 is going to be the year of the team. This is a trend that's been forming for quite a long time, but I do really believe that this is the year where it becomes not just a trend, but the new reality. In 2020, we clearly saw that teams outperformed individuals. And that is why Side is investing 
millions of dollars this year to help all of you grow your teams and do that in service of consolidating more of your market and controlling more of that share and representing more of those transactions. The question becomes why? It's not just for your own benefit or for the increase in your own income, but it's so that more buyers and sellers can actually benefit from the world-class service that you all provide, which is not the experience with the run-of-the-mill average type of agent. So today, Side already has 16 full-time recruiters dedicated to helping you all grow those teams. By the end of March, that'll be over 30 recruiters. You know, there's an old proverb, I believe it's African, that goes, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And we are so very excited to continue going very, very far with all of you. I am really proud to say that today, our partners represent 15 billion in annual sales across over 250 partner brands, making side a top 10 national real estate network, which is up from 5 billion in 2019. By the end of 2021, this year, side partners will represent at least 30 billion in annual sales, which will bring us also very close to the top five. Now, all of this translates into even more referral activity between partners, more off-market opportunities for your clients, and more profound community that masterminds with each other and supports each other and teaches and learns from one another. And so over the coming years, we'll continue to invest in powering the shift that we are leading in this industry, where value and equity is being moved from the brokerage to an experienced agent, where we transform an individual and a team into a boutique brand and into a company that's recognized as the service leader in its community. I am so excited to continue changing this industry of ours together with you, and to do so, as always, to better service and in service of our communities. So with all of that said, here's me sending you a big virtual hug and inviting Hillary uh, to come back and, and join us. Thank you, Guy, that was wonderful. I very much appreciate your virtual hug. And I'd, oops, I'd like to welcome um, Ed Wu, our co-founder and chief technology officer to Join us for a little candid chat. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah. Hey, Ed. Hey, Guy. I like that we're so close, but yet so far. I know. We're very so far socially away. distant, aren't we? I'm just yeah. happy to see you guys. It's been so long. It I has know. been so long. I miss you guys. I'm going to cry. <laughs> oh, anyway. Not, not live on camera. OK, I won't. <laughs> um, everyone likes a good origin story. So I'm not sure that a lot of our insiders know that you two didn't originate from real estate. So. I'd love to ask you both the question as to the why and the how of why you guys decided to dive into real estate. Well, Guy and I had the fortune of not really having a problem to solve yet. You know, we, we both found ourselves uh, in this point in life where we had started successful businesses and we were looking for our next venture. And we just kind of explored all these different spaces that were of interest to us um, all over the place from healthcare to workplace and all that. So. It wasn't until we stumbled upon the real estate space that we found what I now believe is our calling. Yep. Uh, we just fell in love with it, sight unseen. Just a surprise to me. Yeah, yeah, me like as real well. Real estate, really? That's the thing? <laughs> Agents? Totally, yeah. totally. But uh, it's, it's easy to fall in love with the space because of the agents themselves. Yeah, the people. Yeah, the people. It's all about the people. And um, once we, we went into what we kind of now refer to as the customer discovery phase where we were interviewing, uh, having coffee with, lunches with random real estate agents, any of them who are kind enough to give us their time, we began to realize that these are just hardworking entrepreneurs trying their hardest to make a living, and they're stuck playing the rules of this game that's just completely stacked against them. Because I'd had some not so great experiences with, within the industry with agents that I would say are more the average right. uh, type, um, which is again, to say very different than the agents who we partner with and work with. 
And it wasn't until I was exposed to what it actually felt like and looked like to work with a great agent that I realized that they're not just real estate agents, they're actually entrepreneurs who happen to be real estate agents and nobody was helping them. Yeah. And that's what catalyzed things for us. That's what really motivated us is we felt that there, it was this segment of agent that was underserved and more so really exploited. So we set out uh, and started reaching out to agents, as Ed mentioned, and saying, look, we're not, we have nothing to sell. We just have some ideas and we'd love some feedback. How can we help feedback? you? Can we buy you lunch? And I remember doing that with you four times before you finally <laughs> responded. I actually still have that LinkedIn message <laughs> saved. <laughs> yeah, and then I was setting up time, and then you canceling that time, and then us rescheduling, and then canceling and then persisting and then finally we got together for our 15 minute meeting and that turned into what? I don't know how many hours. A couple of like Good. several hours yeah. um, and that's when Ed and I you know we left that meeting like that could be the co-founder she's awesome and that's well, how it all came together. I appreciate you both yeah. very much <laughs> um, but it is true I mean we it is a, a centralized you know agent-centric mission that we have and I greatly and fortunate that you guys decided to dive into that. With a lot of evolution since we started almost five years ago, I would love to hear what your favorites have been or what the biggest evolution you've heard um, or seen, and we'll go start with Guy. Four years ago, it wasn't obvious to most people that teams were gonna be the future. Um, real estate historically has been an individual sport, right? And to the degree that people came together as a group, it was in service of the brokerage. And right. Uh, in reference to that brand, which was not their own. And that meant that they had to actually conform themselves to the values uh, of that brokerage and of that brand and conform and be all the same yep. uh, and present in a way that was all the same. Uh, and today, that is not at all the case. Agents go out of their way to differentiate. Even if they're still affiliated with the traditional brokerage, they're putting their team name out front first. And that's happening more and more often. And uh, you're seeing teams take up more and more share. And it's because when you work together, you're gonna accomplish more than if you just work alone. I use this sort of silly example all the time. And um, it's like, you could take like, the best basketball player in the world, LeBron James, arguably, right? Don't wanna offend <laughs> half the audience. Um, and have him play a game by himself against five high schoolers, and they will beat him nine out of 10 times, even though there's a huge disparity in skill and ability between him as an individual and their best player. But because they have four more, that's more than enough to always win and always be successful. And I think that is only going to intensify. And that, of course, is what we're continuing to lead the way on and invest behind. And it's not just going to be about yeah. the team. It's going to become more about the brand and the company. It's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. But that's going to be the central theme, in my opinion. Yeah. And it has, it has yeah. been that evolution. Yes. Um, Ed, I wonder from a tech perspective, what have you seen over the last almost five years? I, it, what Guy said is perfect because it leads in exactly to what I was thinking <laughs> about. Um, it's 100% the impact uh, on tech of having bigger teams. Agents certainly want to be part of this cohesive team, this like big unit of highly skilled real estate professionals, but they also need the ability to showcase how they're different from everybody else. And we had to pretty much hit the drawing board from scratch. And we've come up with a really great solution, which you know, we'll talk about later. But um, the gist of it is that now associates, associate partners on teams um, have the ability to have a really strong web presence. Awesome. Like anything that they want to say about themselves to the world can be captured on there. And um, just a couple years ago, that wasn't the case. You know, we didn't have that kind of an offering. When we first started the company, we used to talk to agents a lot about how, you know, Ed and I have no idea what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And it's the true. only way we were going to know that 
is for them to tell us. Yeah, exactly. And for us to spend time and observe and learn. And that continues to be the case. That is baked into the DNA, the culture of the company. We're in every respect an input-driven organization. Virtually everything we've ever done and will do will be because we're listening and observing what it is that people are saying and doing. Yeah, it's truly a partnership. And yeah. I, I'm truly grateful for being able to come to work every day, even if it's virtually with you guys and your energy and your dedication to our agents. And um, with that, Ed, take it away. Thanks, Hillary. Side-powered websites were designed with one purpose in mind, to grow your business. These sites are packed with subtle, yet deliberate features that serve this primary goal. We spent hundreds of hours collecting feedback from top producing real estate agents in order to help us build what you're about to see now. From a design perspective, we went with a photocentric approach, which intends to communicate primarily through visuals rather than words. As you can see, we chose to couple large photos with moments of white space to create a visually balanced composition. In other words, we don't want to overload your visitors with too many images, so we alternate between dense, photo-heavy sections and simple white space sections. This creates a visual rhythm, which keeps visitors constantly engaged without overwhelming them with too much information. Notice that as we scroll through each of the pages, you'll see subtle animations. Elements glide in from the sides, you'll see numerical values count their way up rather than just appear. These animations encourage engagement through movement, which brings the page to life. Progressive disclosure was another strategy that the team implemented to ensure the experience is focused for visitors by presenting them with high-level information at a glance and more detailed information if desired, all without ever leaving the page. We incorporated this design strategy into every section, maximizing our utilization of space while easing information dissemination. When we make our way to the bottom of the page, we're presented with pathways. These are simply links to other sections within the site that allow visitors to continue their journey without having to jump back up to the navigation menu at the top and figure out where to go next. Pathways create a continuously flowing experience, keeping visitors fully engaged. Our research indicates that approximately 56% of all traffic to side-powered websites comes from mobile devices, and it's on the rise. Therefore, we chose to design these sites with a mobile-first strategy. This means that design considerations were given priority for mobile visitors over desktop visitors. It also means we optimized for speed by minimizing page load times, providing the largest number of people with the best possible experience. One of the most sought-after features that we've ever encountered is for better team support. Agents need a web presence that both shows they're part of a cohesive team and allows them to tell their unique story. I'm pleased to say we found an elegant solution. Every team member can have their own section within the website that they can make their own. This means custom logos, custom graphics, text, lead capture forms, and more. Team members can even have their own domain names or subdomains to send users right to their section of the site. If a team prefers to keep things simple, they can always stick to a bio for each team member instead. Now, under the hood of every page is a collection of modules. For instance, the header at the top is a module, as is the featured listings, team bios, stats, and so forth. Modules can be added, configured, removed, and reordered, giving each site its own look and feel. For example, if we want to add a blog or client testimonials section to a site, that can be done in minutes. Best of all, these changes can be made by anyone, a member of your team or ours. We will continue to build new modules, introducing additional functionality. This is how we keep side-powered websites always at the cutting edge and within regulatory compliance. You can leave those ever-changing concerns with us. A website is nothing without a powerful marketing strategy behind it. Our websites were built and configured with SEO at top of mind, ensuring they rank as high as possible for the specific search terms that matter most. We've also incorporated best practices from across the industry to create a comprehensive marketing automation suite. Retargeting, for example, is an advertising technique that ensures website visitors continue to see ads for a brand long after they've left your website. When website visitors fill out a contact form, it is imperative that their information finds its way into a CRM. This ensures your valuable leads are stored safely and followed up with accordingly. 
We have a partnership with a best-in-class CRM provider that our websites are deeply integrated with. We pre-configure the CRM with automated email drip campaigns, we provide training for it, migrate your data into it, all at no cost. If a team already has a CRM they're happy with, we always try our best to integrate it with a side-powered website to ensure leads get where they need to go. Paid advertising is a key component of any marketing strategy, but the choices can be overwhelming to say the least, especially in real estate. There are so many providers to choose from, and new ones are constantly emerging. It's hard to know which ones will work. What's more is that advertising campaigns require real marketing expertise in order to execute successfully. Side business managers shoulder this burden for agents by expertly managing their paid advertising needs. This includes choosing the right marketing channels, running campaigns, tracking performance, and so much more. So there you have it. As you can see, we've taken a holistic approach to side-powered websites. These are not just standalone websites. They're a key piece of a thoughtful and deliberate marketing strategy, which includes everything from CRM to marketing automation to paid advertising. This method works. It accomplishes the goal that we have sought to achieve, which is, of course, to make agents grow their business. Thank you all so much for watching. It's truly a pleasure to be partnered with you all. It's all yours, Hillary. Thank you, Ed, for that update. Please join me in welcoming Rick Sharga, who is the Executive Vice President of Marketing at RealtyTrack, the leading provider of foreclosure information for investors, consumers, and agents in the country. Rick is going to dive into what is happening now and what he is expecting in 2021. With consideration of the end of forbearance loans and a potential shift in the foreclosure and distressed property market. Welcome to SIDE, Rick. Hi, I'd like to thank Guy and the rest of the side team for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to be part of the uh, part of the events that the, the organization is is putting together. And congratulations on a, a remarkably successful year for the for the company. Uh, as as most of you probably know, we we entered and exited a recession in record time. Uh, if you go back to uh, the second quarter of 2020, when the the shelter in place and and business shutdowns were uh, mandated by the government on both the federal, state, and local levels, uh, we saw the economy basically seize up. We had a, a record quarter over quarter drop, uh, almost 34% uh, in terms of the gross domestic product, which is how most economists uh, measure the health of, of, of the economy. What was encouraging is what happened in, in the third quarter. Uh, we saw a, a similar record increase on a quarter over quarter basis of, of over 30%. Uh, and so the, the, the good news overall is that the, the drop in, in the GDP wasn't as severe as some economists were projecting, uh, and the rebound was, was about as strong as people could have possibly asked for. We did see the growth rate slow down significantly in the fourth quarter. So when you see those numbers come out, you'll, you'll see them uh, not quite as positive, not quite as strong. Uh, as what you saw in the third quarter. But that's, again, because the, the, the number of COVID infections started to skyrocket again. Uh, and between government mandates and people just deciding to stay home to avoid getting sick, we did see spending levels come down. A big reason for the spending levels coming down is because people were losing their jobs. When the pandemic hit, shelter-in-place orders took place. Uh, we saw the, the unemployment rate spike to about 15%. The good news is that rate's been coming down steadily, although gradually, uh, really ever since uh, ever since we hit uh, the the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, what you're seeing on this particular chart, the the blue bars that are running across the page, are new claims of unemployment, uh, and and that's what you you see in the headlines every week. There's a, a little dotted line that's also running across the page, and that's continuing claims. So these are claims of, of unemployment by people who've been unemployed for an ongoing period of time. Uh, and, and typically, the longer you're in that, uh, in that pool of, of unemployment claims, uh, the more likely it is that your job has been lost permanently. Uh, and that's one of the things that's been very different about this recession from previous recessions. We got about half of the job backs in, uh, in a single quarter. Uh, that's that's simply unprecedented if you look at prior recessions. And, and in fact, that's what this chart is really trying to, to demonstrate. The black line you see on the on the left uh, is all the jobs that were lost in the, in the second quarter uh, and then almost a straight line recovery in the third quarter. So we actually got back, as I said, about half of the jobs we lost in a single quarter. Uh, the, the rate of job recovery has, has slowed down a bit. 
uh, and, and you can see that happening as the line begins to curve. But if you want a point of comparison, if you look at what happened in the Great Recession, and that's the green line you're seeing just above that black line, look at how long it took for jobs to come back to where they were prior to the recession hitting. Uh, it was about a full decade before we got back to the numbers that, that we had before the Great Recession. Uh, and the hope is coming out of this recession that the jobs will be recovered a lot more. So one of the reasons this particular recession has not hit the, the, the housing market nearly as hard as prior recessions is because most of the pain uh, has really been felt by renters rather than homeowners. This could have some implications going forward if you're, you're dealing with investors who own rental properties. Uh, the, uh, there are uh, both uh, federal government, uh, CDC, state government, local government eviction bans that prohibit landlords from evicting tenants who aren't making payments. And this would be one thing if most landlords were big corporate entities or institutional investment firms uh, or, or you know, multinational corporations. Uh, the facts are a little bit different, however. If you look at the single family rental market, uh, over 90% of those units are owned by mom and pop investors who own five to 10 properties. Uh, that's actually equally true if you get into the apartment and multifamily markets as well. So there's probably gonna be some short-term disruption in the rental market but when you're talking about defaults and distressed inventory, uh, unless uh, we, we do see some aid coming forth uh, for the, the people that own rental properties who haven't been able to collect rent. So as I mentioned, the, the, the housing numbers have really been spared some of the pain they might have felt uh, anytime you would have had this kind of job loss, this kind of, of deep recession. Uh, and, and in fact, I remember being on a, a webinar uh, in May with a relatively well-known uh, real estate market analyst who confidently predicted that because we'd seen home sales fall off during the pandemic, uh, in, in March, in April, in May, uh, coming back, but, but somewhat weekly in June, uh, we, we would probably be looking at a 40 to 50% drop in home sales on a year over year basis. Um, not the case, uh, not the case at all. In fact, the pent up demand from the first quarter uh, actually manifested itself in, in increased sales uh, as we got through the summer months and into the fall. Uh, and by the end of November, uh, home sales were actually running ahead of 2019 on a year over year basis. Uh, and that's just a, a, a really a testament to the strength of the housing market. I, I should point out that this demand was really driven by, by three factors. Uh, one was those historically low interest rates that, that we've all been talking about. Uh, and, and that certainly has taken people that were a little bit ambivalent or maybe fence sitters and moved them into active buyers. There's also demographics at play. Uh, the largest group of the millennial generation is approaching prime home buying age. Uh, the, the average age of a first time home buyer is about 35. And the largest group of millennials is between the ages of 31 and 34. Uh, so, so demographics are weighing into this as well. And the third, ironically enough, is that the pandemic has accelerated some trends we were already starting to see. Uh, we, were, we were beginning to, say, to see urban millennial renters uh, become suburban millennial homeowners. Uh, and the, uh, the, the ability to work from home uh, and, and the fact that perhaps being quarantined in a 700 square foot apartment with a toddler wasn't quite as much fun as we thought it would be, uh, seems to have accelerated the, that, that movement into the suburbs. Uh, and, and we're seeing a lot of home sales out there. So those factors are going to continue to play in 2021. Uh, and, and it's very, very likely we're gonna continue to see a growth uh, in existing home sales and in new home sales uh, throughout this year. Uh, we've seen the home sales increase despite historically low inventory. Uh, and uh, the National Association of Realtors has, has indicated that uh, if you're looking at existing homes available for sale, uh, the, the supply is at the lowest level it's ever been since they started actually tracking that number. Uh, nationally, as we ended the year with about a two and a half month supply of homes available for sale. Uh, and that's compared to what's a normal rate of about six months supply, uh, somewhere we haven't been in a few years. Uh, but both the, the trend lines of, of inventory coming to market uh, and the month supply are, are at record lows, which is, is keeping homes uh, from for home sales from being even higher than they really are. A couple of reasons for this. Uh, new home inventory is low. That's a whole separate discussion. 
but existing homeowners are not putting their homes on the market. Uh, research suggests the pandemic has a lot to do with that. Uh, people are reluctant to open up their homes to visitors who may or may not be sick. They're a little reluctant to go to open houses themselves because they're afraid they might catch something out there. Uh, and and there's a, an economic factor at stake here too. A lot of people aren't necessarily sure their jobs are stable, uh, given what's been going on with the virus. And because of that, they're reluctant to take on the bigger financial commitment they would have to take on if they bought a new house. Uh, and they're more comfortable uh, hanging on uh, where they are right now. So a, a lot of factors go into uh, the fact that the people aren't listing their homes. Uh, it, it stands to reason that uh, as the vaccine gets distributed more broadly, if we get the, the infection numbers under control, uh, at some point we'll begin to see uh, more, more of these existing homes uh, made available for sale. One of the things I, I do track is uh, the, the number of people that are applying for loans. Uh, and the Mortgage Bankers Association uh, puts out a weekly report on that. If you look at the red line running across the, the page here, uh, those are 2020 purchase loan applications. So people that uh, are looking to buy a house and have applied for a loan. And you can see that back around March, April, May, those numbers plummeted uh, and, and ran against normal trends, which are for, for more people to be applying for loans in the spring. But since the, uh, the shelter-in-place orders were lifted, uh, we've seen every week since then uh, more people than the prior year applying for loans. And in fact, on a year over year basis, about 26 percent more people applied for loans than applied the prior year. So the demand has been just just off the charts uh, for people looking to buy loans. Uh, projections uh, from the MBA are that in 2021 uh, we'll set a new record for purchase loans. They're they're estimating that about one point six trillion dollars in mortgages uh, will be written for home purchases this year. So there should be a, a lot of business for, for site agents to, to divvy up. So an Econ 101 refresher for all of us is if you're in a market with extraordinarily high demand and extraordinarily low inventory, it drives prices up. And that's certainly been true in the housing market where we've seen double digit price increases uh, for the last few months of 2020 uh, and, and uh, probably more to come in 2021 until the supply and demand imbalance is worked out. So if you're looking at the numbers uh, that are represented by the top chart here, it shows those home price increases. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind about those home price increases is it doesn't mean that every house in the country is going up by 10, 12%. Uh, part of it is, is also the product mix. There's virtually no inventory available right now at low prices, uh, entry-level buyer kind of properties. So the product mix is really heavily skewed toward more expensive properties. So when you see those home price numbers, keep in mind that part of it uh, is, is home price inflation. Uh, and part of it is actually the types of properties that are currently being sold. In any case, it's getting more and more expensive for people to get into the market. And what, what's important to keep in context is what we're seeing on the bottom chart. Even though home prices have been going up, affordability hasn't been hit quite as hard as you might expect because wage growth uh, up until the pandemic was actually fairly consistent for the last few years. And also the impact of, of those historically low interest rates has had an, an amazing effect on affordability, uh, hard to overstate. In fact, one of the odd things I saw in 2020 was that while we were setting record highs for the median price in homes, uh, both nationally and in states like California, on a year over year basis, the average mortgage payment was going down uh, for those home buyers. So really hard again to overstate the impact those low interest rates have had on home prices, on home affordability. That is not something that can go on indefinitely, however. If home prices keep going up 10% a month uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, at some point you hit an affordability wall uh, and things, and things get, uh, get pretty bad pretty quickly in terms of, of home buyers' ability uh, to actually secure a transaction. So we do need more inventory coming to market, uh, and, and we do need to make sure those, that hopefully those interest rates don't go up too much. That's one of the concerns economists do have with the amount of government spending that's going on is, is it does tend ultimately to have an inflationary effect on, on pricing in general, on interest rates in particular. Uh, and, and a lot of folks are expecting that with the new administration, we may see mortgage rates tick up a little bit. 
uh, hopefully not much more than to three or three and a half percent, which is still very low, historically speaking. New home sales were even stronger than existing home sales if you look at, at growth on a percentage basis. Uh, most people who analyze and follow the industry were expecting somewhere between 600 and 650,000 new home sales in 2019. And, and in fact, the year probably ended a little bit closer to 700,000 sales. Uh, what's interesting about this is that, uh, again, this was happening in spite of the fact that inventory was, was at record lows. And the National Association of Home Builders, uh, much like the National Association of Realtors, uh, suggested that new home inventory was the lowest they'd ever tracked historically. Uh, what, what's showing in this chart is, is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Uh, the red area shows new homes that have been built and are available for sale. The blue area shows homes under construction. Uh, and the green area shows uh, uh, basically building permits and housing starts where the, the property really hasn't begun its construction yet. A very high percentage of home sales, of new home sales uh, in 2020, were on properties that either hadn't started construction or were just starting construction but hadn't yet been finished. So uh, people were actually buying on spec. And, and again, a lot of those purchases were in the suburbs or even the far suburbs. And, and one of the trends that we saw last year was that one of the fastest growing uh, sections geographically of the country uh, were in almost rural areas. Uh, so you'd go from urban to suburban to exurban uh, to rural. And a lot of the purchases were, were further and further away from those urban centers. Uh, that's something, again, sort of facilitated by the work from home movement. Uh, it's facilitated by the fact that people no longer have to worry about driving into the office and, and having an awful commute. But it's also because people were looking for larger houses. They're looking for homes where they can uh, comfortably have a home office or two uh, or comfortably have a place to homeschool their kid if they need to do that again. Looking for more space between neighbors uh, so they're not in a, a highly dense, densely populated area in the event that there is a pandemic. So we, we did see a trend and, and high price, high tax, uh, difficult commute cities, uh, places like San Francisco, like New York, like Seattle to a lesser extent are probably the ones that are feeling this the most. Also something you can see in the rental prices, uh, Manhattan rental prices uh, at, at the end of 2020 uh, were the lowest they've been in about a decade. Uh, San Francisco had had month over month, uh, almost double digit price drops in, in rental prices. Uh, for several months uh, toward the end of 2020. So we are seeing that while we're simultaneously seeing suburban rental prices uh, and suburban, vac sub suburban rental prices go up and suburban vacancy rates go down. So very, very different uh, trends than what we might have been seeing uh, it, without the pandemic. Uh, and housing starts uh, finally appear to be trending in the right direction. Uh, you see where they were prior to the Great Recession. That's the uh, one of the, the light blue lines running uh, kind of uh, uh, vertically down the page. Uh, and they really never came back. The builders had overbuilt entering in, into that recession, uh, wound up competing with their own inventory for a number of years. Uh, and a lot of the housing starts we saw since the Great Recession had been multifamily starts. Uh, but single family starts are, are finally starting to come back. It looks like they're going to exceed a million starts a year. Uh, we probably need that number to be closer to 1.2, 1.3 million a year. Um, because we've been underbuilding to the tune of 300 to 400,000 units a year. So, so what we're really talking about here is that inventory numbers uh, have been lower than what we, we really need historically uh, by 300 to 400,000 units a year uh, in both the, the, uh, the new home inventory and the existing home inventory. And both of those need to come back if we're going to get these numbers stabilized. Um, the, the stories we would tell in, in some of the states that SIDE's doing business in and SIDE agents are, are, are doing very well in, uh, very similar to what we're seeing in, in, the, uh, in the overall national numbers. Uh, California in particular, very much like the U.S., uh, but, but a bit more extreme in those numbers. Um, and, and if you're looking at, at this, is number, these are numbers from the California Association of Realtors, uh, which they, they publish on their sites. You can see what happened in November. Uh, over 500,000 uh, uh, properties um, sold, uh, which was a 26% increase on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, Year-to-date sales were actually uh, ahead of 2019 sales. Uh, and you can see that the home prices, even though they dropped, were still uh, right around $700,000 on median. Uh, the supply, on the other hand, uh, was remarkably low. It was a, a under two months supply of, of properties available for sale. 
Uh, and the average days on market in California in November was nine days. Uh, just, just remarkably, remarkably crazy numbers. Um, Florida, uh, similar numbers, maybe not quite as crazy as California, but but you can see that again, a similar similar situation in Florida, uh, where where sales were up on a year over year basis, uh, prices were up on a year over year basis, uh, and and the inventory, the available inventory was was down to two months supply. Uh, so again, uh, keep in mind, normal is six months supply. Uh, days on market, uh, the average days to contract, according to the Florida Association of Realtors, 19 days. Uh, just, just crazy, crazy numbers. Uh, and and uh, and the numbers again will will look a lot like this until we get to a point uh, where the uh, the inventory catches up to 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 the the demand. Uh, some information from the uh, Texas A and M uh, Real Estate Research Center shows that the Texas numbers very very similar. If you look at the uh, the green bars running across the chart at the top, you can see how 2020 numbers started the year stronger than prior years, dropped off in the spring. Uh, interestingly, Texas numbers started to come back a little earlier uh, than the rest of the country in June, uh, but remained strong through the summer and the fall. Uh, and, and again, you can see that the, the months of inventory is is much lower than than what we would like to see normally. Like like uh, Florida, like California, uh, you can see that the months inventory came down to about uh, about two months supply. So uh, everything we talked about uh, at a national level, uh, we're seeing uh, Texas, Florida, California as microcosms of of that. Uh, not much difference to report there. Uh, anecdotally, uh, we, we've heard that there uh, are are strong markets and weak markets in terms of particularly of high-end sales, of luxury sales. Uh, we know there's a lot of investor interest, uh, fix and flip in markets uh, like California, uh, some of that in Texas as well. Uh, so if you're working with investors, uh, their, their, their profits on fix and flips, their gross profits have gone up pretty significantly. Uh, our parent company, uh, Adam Data, just put out a report that suggested uh, the average gross profit on a fix and flip uh, in 2020, it was about $70,000. Uh, Florida, we're seeing a little bit more investor activity in the buy and hold market. So again, if you're working with investors there, they tend to be looking more often for rental properties because the the prices are a little more reasonable and and, and the uh, investor's ability to, to get cash flow in a, in a positive manner uh, is is a little more likely than, than in, in higher price states. Um, probably should point out that in, in California, we've seen a net loss of, of population uh, really trending now for the last couple of years. Um, both Florida and Texas uh, being lower cost, lower tax states have actually seen their, their populations increase. Uh, that might be a trend we continue to see. And, and depending on uh, whatever tax uh, reforms the new administration, the new Congress put in place, uh, it could have an impact on some of the higher tax states as we move forward, and that that can have implications for the housing market as well. Uh, if your your wealthier residents are leaving, uh, which which can create some problems uh, for for uh, in in terms of of having a, a ready market for properties as they come to market, especially those more expensive markets. I want to spend some time on what's going on in the distressed property market, in and because there is a lot of concern when you see the headlines about seriously delinquent loans at record highs. Uh, all of a sudden, anybody who lived through the, the Great Recession and the last foreclosure, foreclosure crisis uh, tends to break out in hives. Uh, what I would suggest to you is that, that we wouldn't really necessarily need to worry as much about these numbers as we might have 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, if you were a borrower who was 120, 150, 180 days past due on your loan, you were either in foreclosure or certain to go into foreclosure. Uh, and, and you were in a market where people weren't buying, where loans were hard to get, and where property values had dropped 35% uh, nationally and, and 50% in markets like California and Florida. Very, very different uh, set of dynamics in today's market. And in fact, these seriously delinquent rates are really a, 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 a factor caused by the government's forbearance program uh, that was part of the CARES Act that was passed back in March. Uh, this program gave borrowers the opportunity to defer their payments for 180 days uh, and then have another optional 180 days uh, to continue to not make payments on their loans. That's the reason you've seen these uh, serious delinquency rates spike. 
Uh, the overwhelming majority of people who, who are this late on their loans uh, are people who have opted into this forbearance program. And what you have to remember about them is if they're 180 days past due or 360 days past due, uh, but but on three on the 361st day, agree to a repayment plan with their with their lender. They go from 360 days past due to current. Uh, and, and by the way, that's what's happening with most of the people as they exit this program. So on the one hand, you can see these serious delinquency rates at record highs. You can also see foreclosure activity at record lows. Uh, these numbers are the lowest they've ever been since Adam Data started tracking this. Uh, and Realty Track started tracking this back prior to the last recession. Uh, in a normal market, about 1% of loans are in foreclosure. When we entered the pandemic, uh, that number dropped to about, uh, it was about a half a percent of loans. So we were running at roughly half the normal rate of foreclosure activity, and, and it's dropped off the map since then. There's virtually nothing going into foreclosure today uh, except vacant and abandoned properties due to the government moratoria, due to the forbearance program working exactly the way it's supposed to be working. Um, when the forbearance program was announced, there was one economist who predicted that 25 to 35 percent of borrowers would opt in. Uh, that would have effectively shut the mortgage industry down. So fortunately, that never happened. Uh, about 8 percent of borrowers opted in at the peak of the program. That number is now down to around five and a half percent. Still a lot of borrowers in forbearance. Uh, it's about 2.7 million borrowers who are in some stage of this forbearance program. Uh, but a far cry from the worst case scenario. Important to note that uh, a lending crease study uh, suggests that about 70% of the people who are in forbearance didn't really necessarily need to be in forbearance. Uh, a lot of them were people that hedged their bets because they weren't sure their job was going to be stable uh, and they wanted the ability uh, to not make a payment if, if they weren't getting paid themselves. Uh, that, that again represents a huge number of these people. And in fact, since the beginning of the program, uh, north of 20% of the people in forbearance have continued to make monthly payments even though they haven't had to. Uh, so again, the fact that we've had at the peak 4 million people in forbearance does not mean you can expect 4 million people to be in foreclosure. You can also see that the number of people requesting forbearance peaked at the very beginning of the program. Uh, this was at the end of March, right before April loan payments were due. And I would submit to you that if the situation were getting worse, you would have seen spikes at the end of April, the end of May, the end of June, the end of July, uh, anytime that next month's mortgage payment was coming due. But as you can see, exactly the opposite has happened. We've had fewer and fewer people opting in. Uh, and because of that, the nature of people in forbearance has changed as well. About 81 people or 81% of the people in forbearance are either on that extension that I talked about, that they had that first 180 days and opted into the second 180 days, uh, or uh, they, they cycled out and then requested a, a re-entry into that forbearance program. To me, this suggests the program A is working exactly as it was supposed to work, giving people uh, enough time to get back on their feet financially uh, and work something out with their lender. Uh, and it also shows that fewer and fewer new people are coming into forbearance, which suggests uh, we're seeing something of a recovery economically. This is important for you to remember, this particular slide. I, I don't expect you to be able to, to read all of the, the, the pieces of the pie here. But what, what you should note is that 87% of the people who exited this program, uh, and that, that exiting began in July after the first three months of the program, uh, through the end of 2020, they exited successfully. Their loan was reinstated. Uh, they, they, they made their past due payments. They got into a repayment plan. Uh, their payments were deferred to the end of the loan. They paid the loan off through a refi or by selling their property. Or they entered into a loan modification agreement with their lender. All of these uh, are successful exits from the program. The other thing to keep in mind in this market is that we're in a, again, extraordinarily high demand, low inventory market. Uh, we're also in a very high equity situation where, again, according to Adam's data, uh, there's $6.5 trillion in homeowner equity and over 70% of homeowners have more than 20% equity. If you're a homeowner with 20% equity, even if you're in financial distress, you don't have to lose your home to foreclosure. You can sell it uh, before that happens. Uh, and, and that's one of the ways, candidly, realtors are using our site is to find those borrowers with equity who find themselves in financial distress and helping them list their property rather than risk losing it to a foreclosure auction. 
So some closing thoughts for you, and, and I appreciate, again, the opportunity to, to be part of this. I'm looking forward to the day when we can do it again in person. It's a lot more fun to, to do that. And, and besides, we all miss guys' hugs. Um, but uh, the, there, the housing market surge we, we saw in 2020 should continue through 2021 because of demographics, low interest rates, and, and some of these trends that the pandemic accelerated. Uh, we should see home prices continue to rise, but the rate that they're rising uh, should begin to slow down as we see new inventory coming to market from the builders uh, and more existing homes being listed. We'll see default activity increase. Crazy to think that 40 million people could lose their jobs and we won't have some increase in default activity. But uh, I, I'm not betting that we're going to see anything like what we saw during the Great Recession. Uh, and, and partly that's because of the, the homeowner equity and the, 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 the severely uh, imbalanced supply and demand that we have that, again, gives a lot of those uh, financially distressed homeowners a chance at a more successful exit. Uh, we didn't talk about this because there really wasn't time to get in, into it today. But, but if you're looking for investment opportunities for your, your clients, take a look at the commercial market. Uh, I, I believe the commercial market's going to be hit harder this time than it is in most recessionary cycles, uh, particularly those, those segments that we talked about being hardest hit, the retails, the restaurants, uh, the hotels of the world. There's probably going to be some short-term disruption in the apartment and, and single-family rental sectors. Demographics suggest those sectors will recover quickly. Uh, Long-term prospects are good. Short-term, some of the landlords may not have the financial backing to withstand a long recession. And ultimately, the performance of the market is going to depend uh, almost entirely on how quickly we can get the, the recession uh, slowed down, the economy back uh, up and running. And that depends, of course, on, on, on how good we are at, uh, at getting this virus under control. So again, thank you for letting me be part of this event. Uh, you have a great, great uh, day and a half uh, to come, uh, great speakers, uh, and, and I feel honored to be one of the people that Side, Side brought in as, as part of your, your speaker group. Uh, wish you all the best for 2021 and, and hope to see you again soon. I personally love nerding out on economic data, and I know many of you do too. It is really interesting to consider, though, that the major economic impact has been seen by those who may not fit the typical homeowner category, which in turn could actually mean that we don't see a large uptick in foreclosures and REOs. It's a lot to digest. Let's take a quick break with the uber-talented musician Harry Mack before we welcome our keynote speaker, Damon John, founder and CEO of FUBU, as well as one of the stars of Shark Tank, who will be sitting down to chat with Guy. See you back here in about 15 minutes. <laughs> 